just want to be vulnerable. It took me way too many takes to make that video. <laughs> sorry, Crystal. Sorry, Ship. Sorry to everybody else. It was, uh, it was Monday night football last year. The Rams were playing against the 49ers, uh, and something happened. One of the fans stepped onto the field and started sprinting around the field with jubilance. He was running. He had pink smoke coming off of him. It must have been some sort of gender reveal. And the, the people cannot catch this uh, elusive man. Like the, the security guards are running around, like diving around. It was almost like a, a movie. They couldn't capture him. That is until Hall of Famer, future Hall of Famer linebacker, Bobby Wagner stepped through the smoke and night, night. Like that dude crumpled. And the kicker is, like, he didn't actually get in trouble for it. Like, Bobby didn't get a fine from the NFL. He didn't have other coaches or players criticize him for laying this dude out. In fact, they celebrated that he did it because he sent a very clear message to anybody who was paying attention the field is for players. And we know this, right? Like we've been in a series for months now where we've been talking about how we are meant to not be observers on the sidelines, but meant to be players in the game where we step on the field ready to run plays for Team Jesus. But too often, we approach the field the same way this guy did, where we get on the field, but we're not prepared and we're not ready for what we're supposed to be doing. We're, we're not equipped for the mission that we've been given and we're wearing our spiritual flip-flops just running around. See, the field isn't just another place for fans to observe. It's not a place for fans to linger. In fact, fans on the field become people who get in the way. They become obstacles instead of instruments. And you and I, we're called to something greater. As people who are committed to the mission of Jesus, committed to the, this mission of taking ground for his kingdom, as, as the prayer is, like as it is in greater Hartford, as it is in heaven. Like, that's the goal, is that we can be a people so sent out and equipped that we are flipping this community upside down. The problem is, we can't do that if we are not equipped to live out that mission. Here's what we need to know. We need to stop playing without pads. We need to stop playing without the equipment that God has given us to run the plays that he has set before us. We need to be a people that are so committed to his mission that we put on the proper uniform and we put on the pads and the armor that he gives us that we can be prepared and equipped and protected to do exactly what he calls us to do. See, if we are to take seriously the mission that God has given us as a church, to make and send disciples who love and live like Jesus, if we are going to go out and do that well, step one is we need to put on our pads and we need to get ready for battle. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open up to Ephesians chapter 6, as we kind of unpack this idea. As you get there, I'm Josh. I'm the lead pastor here of 180 Life Church. And I just want to say welcome. Like, welcome to the end of our series. If you're here for the first time, uh, you, you can check us out online if you wanted to catch up. But welcome to the end of this series where we're really kind of stepping into a continuation of it. See, the hope isn't that we step on the field for these 12 weeks where we unpack it together and then we go about our lives. The hope is that we've got momentum, that we carry the mission that he has given us, that we are no longer in the stands, but we are on mission with Jesus as we are in the game and we are players on his team. And this concept of, of putting on the pads is pretty significant because it's a place where we often stumble and get trapped and forget that we're meant to be equipped. So Ephesians uh, kind of picks up, and this book, Ephesians, is pretty special, really just from the standpoint of what it's written all about. See, there aren't too many books of the Bible that focus fully on ecclesia, which is what it means to be the church, right? Like in Ephesians, is, is Paul just writing out the template of like, hey, this is what it means to be a part of this body. This is what it means to be the bride of Christ. This is what it means for us to live out our faith in community in conjunction with each other. And Ephesians 6 is no different. He says in verse 10, he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And this is a reminder right out of the gate, exactly what we've been talking about this whole time, that, that we cannot be relying on our own strength, our own talent, our own ability, but that there is a strength that supersedes that and that is actually more important that we need to be leaning on. Psalm 33 says it this, this way, that it's, it's not the size of the king's army that saves, nor is it the, the warrior's strength that, that provides deliverance. It's not the horse's strength that saves him as well. It's not good hope. It's actually hope from the Lord. 
Like you and I are meant to pull from the strength that he has. And we have this tendency to try to solve spiritual problems with physical solutions. And it's saying here, it's like, hey, hold on. Before we start fixing this issue, let's make sure we're fixing it with the right thing. My little brother, he wanted to play paintball one time with us, but we didn't have a paintball gun for him. So we gave him a slingshot. (laughs) It was the wrong solution. And he paid for it. We need to stop solving spiritual problems with physical solutions. We have a solution. He says, hey, it's not your strength that does it. Anything that we want to do of any kind of value, is going to be deeply connected to him. And that's the challenge, right? Because the day, is, the day tells us, no, 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 it's the size of our army. It's the number of Twitter followers that we have, or I guess X followers now, right? Like it's, it's the size of our congregation, or it's the fact that we have a building. Let me tell you, we can have none of those things and operate in his strength, and we can turn this world upside down. And we can have all of those things in our own strength and not have the ability to turn our own lives around. It's saying here, I want you to remember where your strength is meant to come from. And your strength has a purpose. See, strength is actually meant to lead us into action. And that action is what? Put on the armor of God. And the language there is super intentional. Because if you are a disciple of Jesus, you have been invited into the locker room. Like you've been invited into the place where all the equipment is, and God says, I have set it before you, but I'm not going to put it on you. We have to choose to do that. See, a lot of times we, we view the armor of God, and we'll get to what the armor actually is, but we view the armor of God in the same way that we view our fitness membership. See, last January, new year, new me, I'm going to look good this year. 11 months in, are you using your membership? Some of us, yeah, but a lot of us, the answer would be no. So your armor wasn't meant to stay in the locker room. It was meant to get muddy. It was meant for battle. It was meant to be something that you put on as you engage in the mission that God has given us. And so often we just leave it on the ground sitting there. And it also is very intentional about how much of the armor we put on. See, sometimes we're like, hey, you know what? This fits right, but this other piece doesn't fit so good. This belt of truth, I don't really know about that, so I'm just going to leave that over here. But everything else fits really good. It says, no, 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 don't put on pieces of it, because if you put pieces of it, it's not going to function the way that it's meant. He's saying, put on all of the, the full armor of God, and then we will be prepared for what? To take a stand against the devil's schemes. He's very clear here that we are doing this for a purpose. He says, so that we can take a stand against the devil's schemes. And that's important because there is a spiritual battle that we are so caught up in what we can see that we forget that we're a part of warfare all around us. And we forget like, that we're meant to be caught up in prayer that's going to keep us connected to him because there is a battle that we are engaging in that we have so often forgotten about. And Paul says there is a purpose for this armor. Now, I want, to be, I want to be very clear, and this is important. You don't put on armor with the expectation that you won't be hit. I think that's our problem a lot of times in, in our faith, is that, that we believe that protection, God's prese- protection means God's prevention. Right? We believe that, he'll, oh, you'll prevent hardship, you'll prevent strife, you'll prevent pain. And I say, no, 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 it's about protection in those things that we're invited into. So you don't put on armor expecting not to get hit. You put on armor because you know you're going to be hit. And you want to be protected in it. Why? Because we don't want to get Bobby Wagnered. Like, I, I don't want to get laid out. I want to be able to take the hit and also continue to take a stand. And as a church body, we need to remember that we're invited into this. But if we don't put on the armor, we're not going to be prepared to engage in the battle. And here's the problem. The enemy, he's not afraid of lukewarm Christians. You know what I mean? Like, like if we're sitting on the sideline, he's not going to worry about us. But if you're in the field, if you're in the game, if you're armored up and prepared, you're a target. We put on the armor because we know the fight is coming. God is sometimes going to call us into the heart that our faith can be displayed that much more. Uh, if you know uh, anything about me and my, my bride, Jenny, we have been in the adoption journey for 
like two and a half years. And this journey uh, has been a wild ride for us. It included uh, an ungodly amount of paperwork. Uh, It included raising an unbelievable amount of money. Uh, It's included just trusting in the Lord in times that were turbulent, and and we had lots of questions. There was a, back in May of 2022, we were matched uh, with a birth mom who had uh, a baby girl that was due in November. And y'all, we were excited. Like, we were, we were pumped, we were praying for this girl, we were expectant, we, we believed, we're like, this is what God has prepared us for, this is what he has called us into, we cannot wait to see this baby girl in our home. We had the, the, the room all ready, her name was above the crib, it was exciting, and then November 4th came, and we'd been praying for six months, and I got a text message that birth mom had missed an appointment with the agency, and we were like, okay, that's fine, and then a couple hours later, I got the phone call that this little girl that we loved was not going to be ours. And I had a couple hours in the middle of my heartbreak to figure out how I was going to tell my bride and how we were going to tell our daughter that Christmas was going to look different this year. I share this on the other side of it, knowing that like God had a plan, right? Like, like our son is now with us, and it's like Ezra's incredible, and he's almost a year old now, and it's just this exciting uh, chance to see God, the, the fruit of following God's call. And at the same time, we didn't know that back then. Here's what I knew. I knew that the armor that I put on didn't stop the hits from coming, and honestly didn't stop the hits from hurting. And yet it was the armor that helped us keep standing and say, God, we know you're good. We don't get it. We don't understand, and this hurts more than I can even speak to. And yet we know you're good. We put on the armor knowing that God is going to call us into situations that are risky. Knowing that we're going to take the hits and that it's going to be hard. And sometimes we're going to feel so broken that he's the one holding us up. And yet he's the one holding us up. Put on the armor knowing that hits are going to come. It continues in verse 12. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is a a verse that we could probably spend an entire series on, but it's not the point. And so the, the point of this is there is an opponent. He's saying there is an opponent and we are actually meant to take ground against him and to do battle against those forces. And they operate from heavenly realms. And so we've got this idea that there's legions of armies uh, of angels. And then we've got, we've got God and we've got the enemy all operating in these heavenly realms. And we are actually a people that have been adopted into that. We've been adopted into that family. We're meant to be operating from those heavenly realms. Again, if we're so caught up in the physical and the things that we see, we're going to miss it. But we're meant to operate from the heavenly realms what we serve down here. And that idea of operating in two places at once uh, would have been really difficult maybe before COVID, but now we get it. I'm about to have a board meeting with, with some of the people who have authority over me. I have that this week. And I'm going to be in New Hampshire and Connecticut and Florida all at the same time while I operate from my office. In the same way, we're meant to operate from heavenly realms as we serve down here. But if we're not connected and if we're not pressing into his strength and who he calls us to be and tied up in his word, it's going to be very easy for us to drift and to fall into the patterns and the current of this world. Ephesians 6.14 says, stand firm then, now we get into the equipment, right? With the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. We're about to get into uh, the, the meat of it where we unpack six different pieces of armor, or if you're really specific, I would say it's five pieces of armor and one offensive weapon. Uh, and God is going to share with us, or through Paul, what it looks like for us to put these things on. And they mean very, very important things for our lives. And he starts with the belt of truth. Now, we know a little bit about belts, but not really belts back then. See, we would have this image, if we heard back then, of a Roman soldier putting on his belt, and what that would do was it wouldn't hold up his pants. It would actually hold the armor in place. And so the breastplate wouldn't be flapping around while he's moving because the belt was on and secure, and it was tightened. The belt was the foundation for the rest of the equipment to function properly. And this word, truth, 
Honestly, decades ago, a pastor might read this and just be like, you guys get it. You know what truth is, right? It's, like, it's, it, it's God's word. Like, it's the foundation we stand on. Like, truth is truth, and it's objective. And they might just move on, but that's not where we are today. Truth is actually one of the things that's most debated in culture today. Truth is something that, that really, we've got this culture of speak your truth, right? Like, because what you believe is true and what I believe is somehow true, and even if they contradict, they can both be true to us. See, we are in the time of moral relativism where it's just relative to who you are and what your experiences are. And we're in this time where we allow what we believe to drive what we take as true. Listen, I, I got to share with you, there is a difference, and we need to know this, there is a difference between what, is, what you believe and what is true. They're not the same thing. There's a difference. Listen, I'm not saying what you believe is not true. I'm just saying it's not true just because you believe it. When I grew up, I've shared this before, I thought I was supposed to be a country singer. If you were behind me or in front of me while I, led wor- or while I sung in worship, you know that's not true. <laughs> Listen, like singing, there's some subjectivity to it, but not with my voice. Objectively, I'm bad. The point is, just because I believed I should be a singer doesn't mean that I was actually meant to do it. It doesn't mean that was God's plan. It just means that I was a little bit confused. Y'all, we have a pro- propensity to believe lies. And the enemy loves nothing more than he doesn't just take a flagrant lie. What he loves to do is he loves to take truth and twist it just a little bit. Because that's the most believable. And then we get caught up in it and we start to believe it and we start standing in it. And y'all, we cannot be a church where years from now we look down at our feet and we find out that we're standing in quicksand because we haven't been applying truth in the way that we were meant to. We need to stand on a firm foundation that we can do battle because, listen, you can't fight while in quicksand. You just sink faster. We need to stand on something firm that we can do battle for the kingdom. There's a difference between what you believe and what is true. Materialism, relativism, racism, consumerism, basically all the isms, are oftentimes things that we believe as true and that are flagrant lies. But if we're not paying attention And if we don't understand what truth actually is, which is the word of God, then we've got nothing to measure it against. And that's when our desires and our feelings, which feelings lie, the things that we get caught up in and our experiences start dictating what we believe is true and we start behaving like it and we totally miss it. We need to stand on something firm. Paul kind of speaks to this in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. He says, For the time will come... And I I believe it has come. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Paul is saying, like, man, there's just this gravity to it for us, you know, like, of like, hey, I'm going to go surround myself with people who believe what I want to be true. And we do this when we read scripture, where we take our desires and we take our beliefs and we take our X, Y, and Zs and our agenda and we apply it to scripture as though scripture should change to what I want it to be, when it should be the other way around. It should be, but I'm going to read scripture and I'm going to open my hands with my belief and I'm going to have an open mind, not for the sake of open-mindedness, but that scripture can drive what I believe so that what I stand on can actually be true. Here's my hope. Here's my prayer for you, and this part's probably not true because I'm still new here, but my prayer is that you don't come to this church because you like the way that I teach. My prayer is also that you don't come to this church because you like the type of music that we have. Listen, those things are good, and I believe that we honor God with, with doing those things in excellence, and at the same time, the why should be what we stand on. It should be a belt that we put on. It's like, hey, we stand on truth, and truth is, one, a good foundation, and two, it's going to lead us out to live missionally in such a way that this kingdom, this world, cannot stay the same while we're in it. That this kingdom is going to flip upside down, and we're going to have a hand in that. But that can only happen if we're standing on the right stuff. It can only happen if everything's in place because we've got the belt of truth on Are we wearing the armor the way that it is meant to be worn? The next piece of armor is the breastplate of 
righteousness. And this one's really kind of cool because uh, the, the breastplate has some really, really important functions. It guards your heart, it guards your lungs, it guards some major organs. And it's saying, hey, like we need to have the breastplate of righteousness on. And that, that idea of righteousness is talking about upright living. Now here's the catch. The breastplate's not going to work right if your belt's not right. And some of us, it's not righteousness that we're pursuing, it's goodness in the eyes of the world because our belt's broken. And so we're trying to live a good life by what the secular world tells us is good when God says, hey, hold on, listen, listen, listen. I've got something different for you, and that's not wise, and that's not good, and that's not where you're called to be. The world might be chirping about it, but that's not what I say. But when we've got the belt on appropriately, we start this upright living that we get to step into. And what's cool about this is upright living, living a life of integrity in the way that God has called us into righteousness um, actually provides some significant and, and even sometimes obvious protection on our lives. I'll give you an example. Fun fact about me, before I knew Jesus, I loved getting into scraps. Like, I, I would get in these physical altercations, and I, would, do, like, and I like, would not win all of them, but I loved it. And then when I met Jesus, something weird happened. I haven't fought since. I haven't had a black eye since I met Jesus. That's not a coincidence. That's because I'm stepping into different environments than I stepped in before. And when I go into old environments, the way I interact in them is different. Why? Because I am different. See, a disciple of Jesus is someone who is following Jesus, changed by Jesus, committed to the mission of Jesus. Like, we're meant to be changed. And too often, we're these people who have not been changed and lived the same way that we always did, but we proclaim a faith in Jesus without ever experiencing transformation in our lives. We need to be different. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 13, which is not like on a, a Paul study today. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. He's saying, listen, like, like, like part of experiencing Jesus isn't just to experience him and then remain the same. It's about maturing and growing and changing. And then eventually, the doing what Paul does and models for us uh, is, is to go out and do it with others. That this can be a process that continues as this world is flipped upside down. One of the greatest anti-apologetics out there, one of the greatest reasons that people see Christians and believe that Jesus isn't true is because they see people proclaiming God and running around like children. They see people who proclaim God and behave the same way that the world behaves. And they don't have that breastplate of righteousness on, and they don't have the belt of truth on, and so they just act the same as they always did. And people see that, and they're just like, how could Jesus be true? If he saved you, how on earth could you act the same? This is not about earning something, for the record. This righteousness isn't about earning something. It's not a checkbox. It's about responding to something that is unearned. It's about saying, like, hey, like, you know what? I know what you did. I know who you are. I stand on your truth, and because of that, I'm going to live in light of it, that I'm going to be changed and transformed, living a righteous life in your name. To not grow in integrity is to not grow, put on the full armor of God. It's to to not step onto the field equipped. We're meant to be changed. We're meant to live this out together. Third piece of armor is putting on your spiritual shoes that are fitted with the readiness of sharing the gospel. And y'all, we, we, we know about shoes, right? We know, and I use we, we liberally because I actually know nothing about shoes. Uh, I don't like picking out shoes. In fact, for Christmas this year, uh, for my birthday, I, I said, hey, just... I want shoes. That was it. No link, no direction. I said, I trust you. Pick out shoes. I'm a size 10 and a half. Why? Because I, I hate shoes. But that's not the point. The point is we, we, know, about, we know about Easy's, which I couldn't even pick one out, um, Jordan's. We, we know about shoes. And this is actually exactly what, what, what Paul is talking about, where, where shoes have a really important impact on military strategy. Like he's saying, and, and what we know from back then, there was a Jewish historian known as Josephus. And Josephus spoke to this. He said, actually, he credited a good majority of Caesar's military accomplishments were based on the, the allocation of funds that he placed in the shoes. Why? Because Roman soldiers had better shoes than everybody else. Which sounds like an Adidas commercial, you know? 
It's like you want to run faster, jump higher, and get the girl? <laughs> Buy our shoes. But Josephus said, no, no, no. Like they had shoes that were technologically so much more advanced than everybody else's that the enemy would see the Roman soldiers a long way off. They'd set up camp saying, hey, they could never make it to us today, so we're going to set up camp, rest, and we'll do battle tomorrow. And then the Roman soldiers were upon them before they could become prepared. This idea of shoes is actually has a significant military weight to it. And you and I, we're meant to be fitted with shoes that are ready to share the gospel. Scripture tells us how beautiful are the feet to those who carry the good news. We're meant to have these beautiful feet because these feet carry us places where we share his truth. Here's the, here's the trouble, though, is a lot of us don't know what sharing the gospel even looks like. And that's, I don't share that to shame you. I, I share that because every single believer starts there. I have yet to meet a child who is like birthed into this world and is like, hey, let me tell you about the gospel. There's an equipping piece to it. We all start there. The point is we're not meant to remain there. Like we're meant to be equipped and prepared. And if you do not know how to share the gospel, I've got your next step. Find someone who does and see if they will disciple you. And have them walk through how they would share the gospel with somebody else. And then have them role play it with you and try to figure it out. That you can become more and more equipped. That when the time comes, and the time I believe will be soon, if you are prepared, it's just amazing how God just places those things in front of you. You're going to be able to lead somebody into the most important decision they could ever make. But too often we're not wearing the right shoes. Too often we're ill-equipped and not prepared. And so we don't do the things that God has called us into Ephesians, it, it continues, uh, and, and what's really cool here is we're stepping into the next three pieces of armor, uh, but there's a distinction between the two. See, the first two uh, in the Greek uses the verb to be, and what that means is you put it on and you don't take it off. Like these things, the belt of truth, like that's the breastplate, like the shoes, those are meant to remain on you at all times. The verb for the next three is to take up, and the distinction is important because what it's saying here is that although we are meant to have it around us at all times and be prepared, it's not that we're swinging our sword around at all times. Sometimes it should be sheathed and just ready for battle. Here's what it means. A baseball player has his cleats and his uniform and his hat on at all times, but he doesn't always have his glove. Doesn't always have his bat. He uses those things when the environment is appropriate for it. And so these next pieces of armor and even the weapon at the end are meant to be used in conjunction with the environments that we step into and here's what it says, Ephesians 6, verse 16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And this, uh, this shield of faith is important because arrows be coming. Not just any kind of arrows. We're talking like King Arthur style arrows that are like dipped in tar and fired your way while they're aflame. And say, hey, if you want to be protected uh, from those things, you need to have a shield that looks a whole lot like faith because the enemy is going to attack. And here's the beautiful part. And I've shared this before. But faith that is untested cannot be trusted. In the same way that a relationship that you have, you don't know the, the strength of that relationship until your first major conflict. You don't know the strength until you are in the storm. In the same way, your faith is meant to be stretched and meant to be tested and meant to be grown. See, I don't know every reason. There's a multitude of reasons why God allows arrows to come your way. But one of the big ones is that you can start trusting the shield that's in front of you. One of the big ones is, is that as the arrows come, you know you're protected. It doesn't mean it won't hurt. and doesn't mean there's going to be times where you're not like, man, God, like, why is this happening? But it does mean that in the middle of it, you can say, hey, I don't understand why, but I know you are still good. It's saying that in all things, right, through, through having a lot or having a little, uh, through being in, in a place of comfort or a place of distress, he's saying in all things, I can do them through Christ who strengthens me. Why? Not because I can just do anything that I want, but it's saying that in any environment I can find peace and contentment because of the faith I have in him. There's this, uh, there's this fable. I don't know if it's actually true. I don't think it is because there's so many different versions of this. But there's a fable of a king who wants to put on a competition. And so what he does is he gets the two best painters in his kingdom together and he says, hey, I'm going to give you this massive reward if you win this competition. Here's what you got to do. I want you to paint peace. 
And so the painters, they go out and they, they paint for a day or however long it takes to paint something really nice. And they, probably way longer. If you're an art, artist, you hate me right now. <laughs> like, you think it's that easy? Pastors only work on Sunday. <laughs> so they go out and they, for weeks, they work on this, this picture. And they, they paint it, they bring it back to the king, and the king looks at uh, the pictures, and the first picture is just this, this, this beautiful stream, and there's, like, it's so just, like, comforting, and there's this, this deer drinking from it, uh, and it's just beautiful, and there's a sunset, and there's a, a hummingbird just resting on the deer's shoulder. It's, it's amazing. He looks at the other picture, and the picture is violent. And I'm talking like there's lightning flashing in the sky, the storm, yeah, the wind is so heavy that it's bending over one of the trees, like it is intense. So the king goes back after looking for a little bit and he makes his decision, he says, hey, I believe that the second picture wins, they get the prize. And the people in the throne room are like, what just happened? Or they're like, hey, like, help us understand, like, like, what, like we're not questioning you, your majesty, but like why did you choose this? Help us to understand. And he says, Okay, let's, let's go look at it. And he walks up to the picture, and he points in the bottom right corner. And in the bottom right corner of this picture that has this violent storm on one of the branches of the tree that is bending over is a bird. And that bird is in a nest, and the bird is singing with notes coming out of its mouth. And he says, this picture represents not peace out here, but an internal peace that transcends anything else that could happen. That's what our shield is meant to do. It's meant to be a faith that, that Jesus Christ has it covered. Like no matter the questions we have, no matter the arrows that come, no matter like how hard it is, we're saying, hey, I can stand firm and maybe even lean into my shield a little bit, that even the arrows that are on fire will be extinguished because my faith that I have in him is enough to protect me. It continues, it says, about this helmet of salvation. And it's a helmet that we're meant to put on, and it protects your mind. But here's the problem. I think some of us, and myself included, we get caught up in some Christian amnesia sometimes, you know? Like, we forget how much we have been saved. Now, the question here isn't like, hey, like, are you doing what you need to be saved? This is saying if you have placed your faith in Jesus, you are saved, but do you wear it? Like, is the life that you live a response to what he has done, or is it not? There's a, uh, a TV show about these people in Tennessee, and they, uh, it's an older show. And they, uh, they weren't always rich, or they really were, uh, but they didn't know it. And one day they, they struck oil. And so these hillbillies moved to Beverly. <laughs> and uh, the, the whole comedy is based on this idea that these Beverly hillbillies um, are living in a different like, standard of, uh, of living. Like They are wealthy now. They have upgraded in status, at least in the eyes of the world, but they live how they always were. What it's not saying here is that wealth is the target. What I am saying is that many of us, we have been adopted into God's lineage, a royal line. But we forget it. And we don't live like it. We don't live in response to the salvation that we have received. And said, hey, we need to put on that helmet. We need to keep it on. We, like, we need to be ready for battle at any given time. Do you wear it? It's like this. It's like if, if I jumped in front of, I hope I never have to do this, and who knows if I would. We'll see what happens. Um, but if I were to jump in front of a bullet for you, and I saved your life. And we're both agreed I survived. Thanks for worrying about me. <laughs> Would the dynamic of our relationship remain the same? No. You go over with your friends and be like, hey, this is the guy I want to introduce you to. This is the guy who took it. Like, he saved my life. And yet Jesus did so much more. And we act like he didn't. We need to put on the helmet of salvation that we can wear the salvation that we have already received. And the last piece of armor, I promise, I'm almost done. Last piece of armor, which truly isn't armor, it's an offensive weapon, is the sword, which is the word of God. And that word, word, is significant because we have one, one real word for word. Uh, in the Greek, they've got multiple words that mean very different things. They're not meant to be interchangeable. You've got the graphe, right? Like graphe is the book. 
Like it's his word written down. Then you've got logos, which is the meaning of the word. It's the content behind what the word says. It's what it actually means. Neither of those are used. We've got a word here called rhema. Now, rhema is the word uttered, the word spoken, the word declared. And in this instance, it's in battle. And we see this in Scripture, where Jesus is in the wilderness being tested by the enemy, and the enemy time and time again gives him these twisted truths where he says, hey, what about this? And Jesus doesn't come out with his own creativity, even though he could have. He doesn't say something witty. What he does is he quotes scripture. He says, hey, I've got a sword, and I know it well, and I know how to use it, and so you might present me with a lie, but I'm going to respond with truth. See, the problem with lies is we don't identify them unless we know the real thing. See, we are in a time where we have more access to the sword than ever before. Most of us have a Bible in our pocket. And yet, most of us also are ill-equipped to use it. A sword that you're not trained to use is dangerous. Most of us have probably had Scripture weaponized against us. We need to be equipped in how do we use the sword. And one of the key ways that we do it is a spiritual discipline that I I would say is largely uh, underutilized, especially in our time, uh, uh, our age of life now, is the memorization of Scripture. Like, what does it look like to actually unpack his truth and understand his truth and then know his truth so well that we can deliver it and present it, that when the lies come in, we can say, I know what you are. I know what you're trying to do, but I've got a sword, and I know how to use it. One of the things that I've been convicted on recently, I haven't actually even stepped into this fully, I've been doing some research on it, but um, is how are we training up our kids to be able to use the sword? It's like the whole Game of Thrones, like Sting or whatever, whatever it is, Needle, needle, that's what it is. You guys are like, you sinner. The <clears throat> <laughs> point is, like, like, giving our kids, like, the ability to use the sword that they're supposed to be able to use and equipping them to, to do it. And one of the ways that I found uh, you could do is Spotify has all these different songs that are literally just scripture sung in a catchy way. It's going to drive you crazy. You're going to be, like, singing it in your head, and you're going to be like, this is, this is on loop. And yet you're going to know the sword, and they're going to know the sword, and you're going to be growing together as we figure out what it looks like to put on the armor of God. Y'all, this armor is meant to be used in concert with each other. Like, we're, we're meant to be using these as we do battle together, and we have to put on every piece because we don't, like, frankly, I don't want to be a liability when I'm fighting beside you. Like, I want to be somebody who is meant to be on the field, equipped to be on the field, that we can run plays for the king. And you and I were meant to have the pads on. We can't keep playing without pads. We need to put on the armor of God that we can live out the mission in the way that he has called us to it. What would it look like if we came to the battle prepared? What would it look like if we took it seriously? I'll tell you what it would look like. It would look like in greater Hartford as it is in heaven. It would look like his kingdom coming down here to rest on earth that we can say, hey, I am on this team and it's for his glory and everything's changing around me, not because of my own strength, because of the strength that I am tied to as I wear his belt of truth, as I've got that breastplate on of righteousness and upright living when I've got the shoes on that are wider than these because they're covered in righteousness, that I've got it all covered, that I've got the helmet of salvation on my head, that I can be protected, I've got the shield on my arm and a sword that I can swing around. Why? Not for my glory, but for him. Jesus has it, but we have a part to play. We got to put on the armor. We got to do our part that we can be prepared to engage in the battle. Jesus, Jesus, we are grateful for the way that you uh, present the armor to us in a way that we could easily put it on. And yet, Lord, I know that there are some things that weigh our arms down that we cannot put it on as easily as we should. And so I just pray that you you free us up that we can be so obedient to your truth that we can't help but put on the armor you have presented before us. I pray that we are a people that love you enough to live lives that are sacrificial and alive that is about being in the game and on the team that you have called us to. 
Help us not to run plays in the way the enemy runs plays, but to be changed and to be different. Pray this in your name. Amen.